So um, our last talk for today is um, Christian Schwart, and he's going to talk about natural language processing uh, with Python and Beam. So really excited about that. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. It's, uh, I'm really glad you stayed so long and uh, you're attending my talk. It's, it's obviously a pleasure to have you here. So I'm, uh, I'm going to talk to you about how we use um, how we use Beam for natural language processing at Helix, uh, where I work as an NLP engineer. So Helix is a, is a small pharma company, and we work in, in drug repurposing. Our primary goal is to, to deliver a, a hundred drug repurposing projects in rare disease space by 2025, and kind of using uh, machine learning to speed up the drug discovery process. So that's our, our main goal. The way we do this is by focusing on, on drug repurposing, which has the benefit of, of you having already a safe drug that you're trying to match with, with a disease. In our case, mainly rare diseases, because uh, traditionally rare diseases are, have, uh, don't really have treatment, so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's way more of a struggle for patients. One of the difficulties in, uh, in, in this whole space is is how there's a vast range of, of biomedical literature. There's 29.1 million PubMed records. So PubMed is a, is a biomedical uh, paper archive. And it's very difficult if you, if you were just a pharmacologist to stay, stay up to date with all the, all the research. So traditionally, let's say a pharmacologist would, would read through papers, would come up with some hypothesis about why a particular uh, disease, what, what the, the pathways are, what kind of gene expressions are causing it, and then they'd come up with a molecule uh, that, that would, would cure it. But as this data is, is massively blowing up, it's, it's becoming a prime candidate for us to, to use Beam and, and process it and actually use some modern NLP tools to extract more and more information out of it. So the, our, our primary goal is to extract drugs, diseases, and their relationships to infer novel drug disease relationships, and in particular, treatment relationships. So we want to find new, cure, new treatments for, for diseases. So the way this, this works in our, our NLP pipeline is we initially we're, we're looking for these biomedical ent entities so through named entity recognition. Um, then the next step is we use a dependency parse to, to identify the relationships between them. And this way we, we get some, some useful candidate triplets. And then the last step of our process is we try and link entities to existing uh, curated knowledge bases or external data repositories. So in the biomedical domain, this could be some kind of gene database where you find more information about a gene or, or any kind of uh, specific information about one of these, these entity types. So the way this would work, uh, for example, in, in the sentence aspirin treats headaches, is we'd, we'd just parse these, these sentences and then we'll, we'll extract these entities. Then the next step would be we'd, we'd look at the dependency parse tree. In particular, the way we generate our triples are the triples are practically subject verb object triples so this is a this is a quite standard way of potentially doing this so then we'll we'll be looking for for what is what is the subject verb object relationship here so then aspirin would be the head of this relationship treats would be the relationship and and uh, headaches would be the tail of the relationship in some cases this could be a little bit more complicated if if this relationship is a little bit longer um in such a situation, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about it a bit later, like what you can do, but there's different NLP approaches you can take. And then the last bit of this process, just walking through this aspirin example, is in this case, we, we find a mesh ID for it, and, and this is what the way we, we can find all kinds of information about what aspirin is, some, some more knowledge about this, and this, this mesh ID might be used in other ontologies as well, so it's quite important for uh, resolving these entities. So then the, the final step once we've got these triples is, is we build a graph from it. Um, in, in this case, this is just a tiny graph, but just to give you an idea of, of, of what the output is of this process. So if you have, have this graph, the, the two main use cases for it 
are one, if you, if you generate a large enough graph, then you use the relationships within this graph and uh, some um, inferring different edges to predict potentially new drug candidates. So that would be the way you, you directly use this. And the other advantage of this is that this graph also has papers on each edges. So this treatment would be mined from a particular Pub, PubMed article, and so on. So this also helps you in, in building an evidence chain in explaining your models. So if you use a different model potentially for predicting your drugs, uh, which you would probably, you might as well, then via generating these type of pathways, you can, you can then have a plausible explanation of, of why your disease you know, works the way, way it does uh, based on, on medical evidence. So the next bit, of the talk, I was thinking about walking you through some uh, a Jupyter notebook to kind of give you an idea about how simple this is all with uh, Spacey and uh, and uh, and Beam because it's it's really really simple and it's probably mainly because the Spacey API is, is is a very simple NLP API. So all I'm doing here is I'm importing the the NLP model that we used to, to do all the steps I was talking about, and then I'm, I'm just mocking the entity extractor here. So, but this, this, this way of using the entity ruler can also give you an idea of, of what you could do if, if you'd be doing something quite naive with a vocabulary. Um, so next, I'm um, just setting up some more setup things, and then as soon as that, you can actually visualize your entities, have a look at what your dependency parse tree is looking like. You've got the subject relation here, this object, a direct object relationship here that you're looking for. And this can give you a good idea about what, what's actually happening in your model. So the next thing is we, we just load up our, uh, we, we just make a little uh, do FN. I'm using this kind of lazy initialization with, uh, with, uh, uh, with the bundling to to load in my model, and then as soon as I'm done with that, I can uh, I can just start my my pipeline, and in this case, it just takes these two um, JSON strings, and then it reads them in. Hopefully, this takes a bit of time because if the the spacey model takes a couple minutes to to read in, so hopefully we'll we'll get there. Well. If the demo gods smile on me, okay. So yeah, it, it, it ran. Um, there is also like an interactive Jupiter runner actually that I only realized existed for Beam last night, but sadly it only works in Python 2. And my uh, so I was using Python 3 for for this Jupyter notebook, and I didn't feel like uh, kind of going back to Python 2. So um, it's really cool though. It, it would have showed you the a similar thing to the Dataflow UI for how, how things work. So I think that's quite useful if you, if you use, use something like tiny Python scripts to test out how your, your, your uh, pipelines work. That's probably the way I usually develop these, is write kind of small script and uh, just have a look at w how everything is, is running through it. So yeah, um, and here you can see, so all, I'm, all I was doing throughout here was um, just adding in an entities a section with all the entities, and then I, I just output that same JSON, and you can see that we've got these these entities appearing here. So the next step of the process is so now you've you've enriched these entities would be to to actually have a look at at the dependency parse tree. So we, we want to get to triples from these entities to then use, use some knowledge graph reasoning. So what's happening here is we're iterating through all the noun chunks in, in this sentence. So noun chunks are uh, a way to, 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 to look at noun chunks is they're, they're a noun and, and all the words describing the noun. So for example, um, the shiny phone, that would be a noun chunk, and the shiny would also be part of a phone. So this is 
a kind of easier way for you to get, for example, a heart attack as, as one entity. And, and this is where we kind of go back to also, what could we do potentially with this um, can help prevent? So without going into too much details, with, within Spacey there's, there's a form of things called, called spans, and you can merge spans. It's, a span is like an abstraction beyond a token, so it's, a, it's an abstraction above a token that you can use to, to kind of fine grain your representation of tokens, which is quite useful when, again, you're generating these triples, because you'd, you'd probably want to have, can help prevent as one relationship, or, I'd, or potentially you'd take prevent. You know, there's, it really depends on your use case, really. So the, for the next bit, actually, I'll, I'll need to run this in this notebook, because if I run the two, one after the other, it, um, it kind of breaks in my notebook for some reason. I think this is uh, just a bug with, with uh, running, uh, yeah, running these in a, in a Jupyter notebook, like one after another. So, so again, here all I'm doing is iterating through each noun chunk. Then I'm, I'm looking for these n subjects, which are the subjects, right? And then I'm, I'm looking for something that, that is, is uh, connected to a verb, right? So, so in this case, for example, you can see aspirin is here, and, and then its head is help, in this case, in, uh, in this sentence. So um, I know I'm in the right place, so then I'll, I'll just extract the, the verb, I'll take that as the relation, then I'll take the head, for the noun chunk, and then all I'm doing is looking if there's anything that's the target of, a, of an object relationship and, and putting that in as the tail of the relationship. This is definitely a quite naive way of doing this, but you can definitely you know, kind of refine this and complicate it a little bit more around, around your own use case. So here again, all, our, all that happens next is all these relationships would be extracted then in this case, um, and then you, you'd, have, you'd have these relations. And um, the next step in, in your pipeline would be probably reformatting your graph and, and actually doing some pre-processing, in particular deduplication and um, probably deduplication and some potentially some uh, merging of different relationships. So it works quite nicely because, because um, doing all this, this hard processing through Spacey is quite computationally expensive. So when when going through these steps, it's, it becomes um, quite, quite a, a difficulty that all your processing is happening in these NLP, NLP extraction nodes. And afterwards, you have these light, light processing steps which don't really take that much um, compute. So using Dataflow, we, we use Dataflow to execute all of this, and it really helps because it scales up and down depending on our needs. So it scales up quite high. We get about 2,000 CPUs to process the 29 million documents when, when it's, it's peaking. And then once we emitting the different nodes in the graph, obviously our, our machines are going to be spun down and, and we, can, we won't need to, to worry about it. And then we just persist it into, into BigQuery, so where we then take it for, for further uh, different, different nodes and, and different, different places. So. So yeah, the, the parallelization with Beam is a, is a massive asset in, in getting through this. And uh, Spacey is also a really good tool for uh, doing natural language processing at, at an industrial speed. So Spacey is less accurate than some other, other tools. Uh, so in particular, Stanford Core NLP is, is, is a little bit better. But um, it's way faster. So it's, that, that's some advantages, definitely, of this approach. So throughout the whole process of us using Beam, probably the, the biggest challenges were definitely uh, Python 2 support of, of, uh, of Beam. So we are, Beam is, 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 is the cause of legacy code in, in our, our stack. All our other code is Python 3. So um, we, because we started using Beam in production about nine months ago, so, so now we're, we're facing the the challenge of, of migrating up to Python 3. And uh, since then, we've had like a cascading legacy, legacy issues due to that. Um, 
Another issue that I think other people have talked about a lot as well is definitely Unicode support is a, is a lot more painful in, uh, in, in Beam. So, so I, think, I think that these two, two bits were, were definitely the main pain points for us. At, at this point in time, we, we mainly we, we use this whole process in a, in a batch, batch form. At some point, we'd, we'd like to potentially stream it, though in our use case, probably something uh, like something talked in the Franken batch talk would have would have worked a lot better. So something like an uh, Airflow-based periodic batch jobs would would probably work better because we don't need we don't need uh, all the papers available right now. Even if we have a day delay, that's perfectly fine for us when we're building our graph. Um, so yeah, that's that's uh, that, that w those were the challenges with Beam probably and. With data flow, sometimes I think it's, it can be a bit difficult uh, to find error logs. Um, and I think we, we also kind of struggled in, in applying some of the things in the documentation, in particular templates. We, we thought, I don't know, it, it must be a way, way simpler, but it was something we, we didn't really know how to do. But I think Beam is still a quite mature tool at, at this stage for, for Python. I would suggest other people who, who would like to do uh, this type of NLP job to use Beam, because it, it really allows you to not worry about cluster management if you use it with Dataflow. Um, and with Spacey together, you, you get very strong NLP capabilities out of the box through a very simple Python interface that you can do all your all your extraction and enrichment of your data, and then push it on along to your machine learning models upstream. So I'd say it's a, it's a really, really good stack. Um, if you've got any questions, now's the time to, to ask them. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Um, maybe I missed that part in your uh, uh, scripts because uh, I couldn't read them. Uh, did, did, did you use uh, Beam to train spacey models, or was it just uh, so so built-in functions of spacey? So what we do here is I'm I'm just building at this stage, but we actually do use the same process to to train spacey models as well. What we we generate. Um, we gener using our vocabularies from, from different data sources, we actually do use Beam to, to generate data through, through PubMed that we then use again to, to refine our spacey models. And then we take those spacey models, and when we're doing the extraction, we, we use these updated spacey models. So that is what we, we do use in, in production. But in this example, we, I, I didn't do that. It's, it's very simple to do with spacey. The, if you if you're planning to do something like that, it's uh, it probably about 100 lines of code. Any more questions? Sorry. Sorry, thanks for the talk, uh, very interesting. Um, a question about the knowledge graph. Maybe it's not a core subject, but I was curious. Uh, how are you storing that data? Are you maybe using a graph DB, uh, new for yay, something like that? Or so <laughs> we, we, we <laughs> the only reason we use new for j is to produce visualizations of our graph, yeah. because it doesn't really work very well um, for, for other, other things, for, for us at least. Uh, but but it, it does make like nice visualizations for 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 us, um, and and people are very impressed with the visualizations usually. So um, so the way we we actually store the the graph is we 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 just store store these the the relationships uh, in in Google buckets actually. That's that's all we do, and then we take the the buckets as the input into our uh, our upstream machine learning. So we we don't we find this approach works the best for us. I think when we tried doing more complicated things with Neo4j, it, it just broke. So I, I think the 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 graph is is quite big when you when you enhance everything. So I was I was just looking at 
at some some entity extraction before the talk, and for fifty thousand uh, sentences, um, we we extracted about two hundred and fifty thousand entities. So the reason for that is abstracts have quite long sentences. It's it's quite scientific language, and and you usually have quite a few entities in there as well, different genes, all the different things interacting. So so the then the graph later on blows up quite 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 a bit. So and that is obviously just a very small sample. So uh, yeah. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. All right, that's it. Yeah, thank you, Christian.